Coming up on 2020 on ID, the yoga teacher who loved her husband and the home they built with their own hands. It's a spectacular home and you'd never want to leave. But when another woman entered the picture, would she kill to keep it? Somebody's in my house. Somebody's in my house. Did an intruder attack her and her sleeping husband? What else happened that night that we don't know about? This whole thing about the yoga and the peace and the tranquility, there are two Lindas. Anger does a lot to people. But could it lead her to attempt murder? Are you saying you think I have something to do with it? Hello and welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. If there's such a thing as a good divorce, this was it. He was getting his freedom. She was getting a very generous settlement. But a wild card was about to derail this near-perfect parting, one that would change the end of the story and land the couple in a hospital ER. In 2010, Jim Avila first unraveled this mystery in Maine. In a faraway, peaceful corner of America, deep in the woods, in the middle of the night, a panic plea for help. Somebody's in my house. Somebody's in my house. The house is the Dolliff House. Everyone here in Standish, Maine, 30 miles outside of Portland, knows it. The Dolliff family has lived on this land for nearly 100 years. It's a close-knit town. Everybody's connected. Uh, unfortunately, bad things do occur there from time to time. One of those bad things is underway at the Dolliff House this April night in 2009. He shot me! He shot me! Your husband did? I, no, no! My husband's not answering me! I just hear this gurgling noise! Okay, what's your name now? Linda! My name's Linda! Linda and Jeff Dolliff, a high-powered management consultant who traveled the Northeast to help companies downsize, married 12 years earlier, the second for both. Jeff swept Linda off her feet with his rugged good looks and no-nonsense main personality. Jeff was my hero. He wanted a partner to work on the land. She told him, find somebody that's going the same place you are, and you'll get there twice as fast. It turned Jeff's head. His family's been in this area for six generations. And shortly after he met, he said, you know, I've been waiting my whole life for someone to love this place as much as I do. And not long after they married, back in 1998, Linda and Jeff Dolliff started on their life project, their dream house. First, look at the Linda Jeff mansion. We harvested the trees, we sawed the lumber, we planed them into boards, we stood up the walls, we installed our own flooring. Hi, we're in my closet right now. Some mirrors and cabinets from all my girly type stuff. It's a spectacular home with a beautiful fireplace and a hot tub, and you'd never want to leave. It's like being on vacation every day. For Linda, the centerpiece of the home was her yoga studio. It defined her, was her hobby and livelihood. She taught a handful of students the body stretching and mind calming effects of yoga. It's not just a physical activity to me. It's not just that I'm a teacher, it's my way of life. Her students loved her. She embodies peacefulness and loving kindness. I have seen her open a window and whisk a bug out of her studio rather than squash it. But after a dozen years of Linda and Jeff Dolliff's idyllic life, in the months before they are attacked in the middle of the night, their marriage really begins to crumble. Linda is having trouble with Jeff's three daughters from his previous marriage. And I had three teenage stepdaughters. I've been a teenage girl myself, and it's no picnic. Jeff complained that Linda was never happy anymore, and he wanted out fast. But Linda was holding back, worried about losing her home, despite a generous cash offer from her husband. Did you still think that you might have a chance at saving this marriage? The door was not completely shut. We negotiated the divorce up to a point where I actually felt very comfortable. It was not the usual divorce. Even after agreeing on terms, Linda and Jeff remain in the same house they both love so much. Jeff promises to build her a new one across the street. And while they wait for the papers to be signed, they still enjoy each other's company, intimately. 
I loved him. And if we wanted to get into the hot tub and have wine, then that's what we were going to do. And that, says Linda, is exactly what happened the night of the attack a surprisingly romantic night between two people about to divorce. A hot bath, two glasses of wine, sex, and then a return to their separate bedrooms for sleep. I had heard some nondescript noises, nothing that seemed alarming to me. I walked down the hall, heard a loud bang, um, experienced some pain, fell. Linda says the pain was sharp, and from the bang, she figured out she'd been shot in the midsection. I saw movement, and that's all. When I opened my eyes, in front of me, there was a gun on the floor. I reached for the gun, made contact with it. It fired. It scared me. I dropped it. Certainly, my husband would be here, and I called out to him. What were you asking him, Linda? I absolutely don't remember. I had to get to the phone. I had to get help. An unseen attacker in the night, her husband broken and bleeding in his bed, unable to speak. On the 911 call, Linda can be heard trying to talk to her husband. Did you see anything at all? Surprisingly, that help was not that far away. We have a shooting at Dolloff Road. Sheriff's Detective Sergeant James Estabrook was patrolling nearby. Home invasion in progress with shots fired. So immediately we start responding and started down the driveway. We don't know what's there, who's there, where they are. Sergeant Estabrook had his gun drawn and eyes on the house when he saw something. Right in the windows at the door, there's movement. It's a flash, it's a person, is what I say it is. I can see one person in the window, I'm gonna get some eyes on the house. Linda, can you turn the lights on in the house and go to the front door to meet the officer? And when the door opened, she came outside, just kind of falling out of the front door onto the front steps. Estabrook makes his way upstairs, not knowing what he's walking into. The first thing I notice is on the second step, there's a uh, shell casing. Halfway up the stairs, there's another shell casing. As I break the plane of the second floor, there's a handgun lying right at the top of the stairs and I'm looking right down the barrel of it. No one behind the handgun, this is good. Detective Sergeant Estabrook was prepared for just about anything, except perhaps what he saw next. In the open door in the bedroom, a body on the bed, it ends up being Jeff Dolliff. He's naked, he's covered with blood. He was just an absolute mess. Paramedics are on the way. A woman shot, her husband badly beat. But what about the shadow in the doorway? Was a third person still in the house? And what about Jeff? Could he survive and identify his attacker? If we didn't get help to this guy, he was gonna die. Stay with us. Linda Dolloff and her husband were living together while they went through what seemed to be a friendly divorce. Then, one night, a 911 call comes from Linda. She's been shot and Jeff's severely beaten. The attack would reveal things in this house might not be as idyllic as they seemed. Once again, Jim Avila. Linda, the beautiful yoga teacher with a gentle spirit, 
is a crumpled mess on the front porch. Her handsome consultant husband, Jeff, is even worse off in his bedroom. And police have no idea who's responsible for the violent scene at the Doloff family home in Standish, Maine. We've searched the house and we don't have anybody. My next best move is Sergeant Winslow, go get your canine. Sitting in the back of Sergeant Al Winslow's squad car, waiting to be called upon, is an eager German shepherd named Jag. We covered all the exits. I had Jag work the edge of the wood line. If anybody would have exited the residence, gone across the grass, into the woods, he would have picked up that scent. He showed no interest whatsoever and did not pick up any tracks. Both victims are now en route to the hospital. Linda Dolloff's wound requires surgery to repair torn flesh and blood vessels, with bullet fragments still lodged in her hip. But Jeff appears to have been attacked with a baseball bat, and his wounds are much more serious. He's in critical condition, with fractures on both sides of his head, a broken nose, both cheekbones broken, and more chipped bones inside his skull. I had doubts that, that he would make it. His injuries were life-threatening. He was unstable at the time that we transported him. Linda's injuries are not life-threatening. She undergoes surgery to repair the damage, and soon she is well enough to go to sister's house to recover. While she's there, Maine State Police Detective Bill Ross pays her a visit to ask her about that intruder. I don't know if that's somebody upstairs walking. There are random acts of violence. It's certainly happened before. It happened recently, in fact. A home invasion in Standish, within a few miles of the Dollops, and just a month before. Police describe what happened here as the ultimate horror show. They say the midnight was... intruder used a baseball bat in that attack, too. So police looked into it, only to find that there was already an arrest in that case. Plus, in the attack on Linda and Jeff, whoever committed this bloody crime didn't bother to steal anything. There were no guns taken. There was cash in Jeff Dolph's bedroom. Jeff Dolph's wallet had over $300. There were three kitchen drawers that were all pulled open, and they didn't appear to be ransacked. Since Linda says she didn't see the attack on her husband, police were hoping Jeff Dolph would somehow survive. But he'd been in a medically induced coma for weeks. He said it's the first time he's seen a human body alive with the nose bone driven into the brain. I mean, yeah, I'm a tough guy. When Jeff did wake up, doctors still weren't sure he'd make it. To this day, he has serious physical issues that could suddenly take his life. What I'm left with today is somebody else's teeth in the front, no teeth in the back. I can't smell, can't taste. The side of my face, I have a feeling, but it's almost like it's a Novocaine. Um, my eye waters all the time. And my legs are uh, right straight full of blood clots. The guys that worked on me, God bless them, they put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And for police, here's the big problem with Jeff's condition. Whoever tried to beat his brains in succeeded in killing his memory. We haven't really even established at this point what you remember about that night. Nothing. Total blank. Absolutely nothing. And when asked who could have done this, he tells Detective Ross he has lots of enemies. His job as a corporate consultant involves downsizing, deciding who gets big dollar contracts, and perhaps more importantly, in this case, who does not. He says things been rough on the job lately. You get really ugly after weeks. Really ugly. Later, in front of a grand jury, he explained, "Who would want me hurt? I can give you a list of a thousand people." There's always people that would love to punch me in the nose. But police aren't buying a retaliation attack or a burglary gone bad. A disgruntled assassin would likely bring his own weapon, and the house looked too occupied to encourage a random home invasion. I think with any job, you're going to piss people off. You're going to, people are going to be aggravated with decisions that you make. But at what point does that rise to, I'm going to come to your home on a holiday weekend with five cars in the driveway and commit this crime. So Detective Ross turns his attention inside the house, asking questions about Jeff and Linda's impending divorce. I want to know about your relationship with Linda. Did she want a divorce? I don't think so. Sitting right there in Jeff Doloff's hospital room, Detective Ross had an idea. Let's a trap for Linda. I've got my phone right here. I've got my recorder. Let's call Linda right now. Are you willing to do this? 
The detective wants to get Linda talking, hoping hearing Jeff's voice for the first time since the attack would lure her into making a mistake. And what he was looking for was a story. Tell, tell Jeff what happened. Hello? Is Debbie, is this Linda? Jeff? Yes. It's Linda. Can I come see you? Linda has no idea she's being recorded or that police are beginning to look her way. I'm hearing rumors that someone took a baseball bat to me and shot you. Is that right? I was shot. I don't know what happened to you specifically. Linda tells Jeff what she does remember. We got in the car and had some wine. We made love. After a while, he started snoring. But I couldn't sleep. I went back to bed. In the other bedroom? She says the next thing she knows, while heading down to the hall to the bathroom, she's shot. I just heard the loud bang, and I fell. Because why would, A, they beat me with a baseball bat and shoot you with my gun? I have no freaking idea. And then for the first time, Jeff says it out loud. He's beginning to think she had something to do with his beating. You should have heard somebody 10 feet away from you. You should have seen mm -hmm. somebody 10 feet away from you. There's only one person I know is really pissed off at Jeff right now. It's you. Was there anything that you said you would like to take back now? Absolutely not. That was a way for him to be able to talk to me and hear my own voice saying that it wasn't me. But police had hoped for much more than that. It was their chance to hear how Linda reacts to pressure, but she admitted nothing. Still, within a month, even without a confession or direct evidence against her, police make the yoga instructor and Maine Woods Peacenik their central suspect in the brutal attempted murder of her husband, Jeff, hauled down to the police station. You have the absolute right to remain silent. And accused of one of the most horrendous personal hand-to-hand -hand attacks Standish, Maine had ever seen. Are you incapable of a violent act? I'm incapable of doing anything like that to my husband or, or any other living creature. So what did police have on it? When we come back, police think they find someone who might just make this gentle lady turn bat-swinging monster. Linda Doloff in the interrogation room questioned about the other woman in Jeff's life. Next. Everything that happened happened up on the second floor, right? Yes. Jeff Doloff is a wounded and confused husband. And this right here is a bullet hole. Beaten with a baseball bat as he slept in this bed. His wife shot just outside his bedroom doorway. And he cannot remember a thing about what happened that night. Set the scene for me. It's Linda's story that doesn't make sense to Jeff. When she got here, she said it was dark. She heard a loud noise and she fell to the floor. Right here is where she's allegedly shot. Jeff says the hallway is never completely dark because of an outside light. You had light here. So she should have seen she, something. She, when a guy is that, when a person is that close to shoot you. Jeff is also troubled by the choice of weapons used in the attack, wondering why he was beaten with a bat when right next to his bed was a dresser drawer with two guns in it, one of which was used on Linda. So what about According to the story, came in here to do this to me. Besides finding my bat in the garage and beating me, they would have had to find that weapon, load it, and then shoot her coming down the hall instead of just hitting with a baseball bat. So this whole thing made no sense. It's what bothered Maine State Police, too. Mm -hmm. Bill Ross, the lead detective in the case, wanted Linda in the hot seat, bringing her to this room where he has a hidden camera located here in the smoke detector, recording it all. Were you mad at Jeff that night? No, I had no reason to be angry with him that night, no. Linda Doloff seems stunned when told almost immediately Jeff thinks she is behind the attack, and her story of an outside intruder isn't making sense. Jeff thinks that you might have something to do with what happened to him, okay? 
it's difficult for us to see how Jeff was assaulted by, say, someone else that came in from outside the house. What else happened that night that we don't know about? I don't know how to answer that question. We had a nice dinner together. But then police dropped the bomb, unveiling what they believe is Linda's motive for the attack. They had found out from Jeff something Linda neglected to tell them. A week before the attack, her husband of a dozen years let the other shoe drop in a painful revelation. Not only did he want her out, he was bringing a potential replacement girlfriend up to the house Linda loved for a look-see. I had told her there was a woman in Mass I'd met when I was working down there, and I would like her to come up and see the farm, to meet the dog, to meet the kids, to meet my, my mother. I mean, how did that sit with you? That, that couldn't have been an easy thing to hear. Well, no, and I had plenty of time to get accustomed to what was going on. I mean, we started talking in February, mm -hmm. um, and I was hurt, of course. Then Ross ramps up the pressure. I think Jeff wanted to move on with his life. I think Jeff was looking to push you off to the side. I think you I didn't feel that way. He was taking care of me. But Linda refused to give in and would only admit. I was hurt, yes. And she wasn't having any more of this line of questioning. Within minutes, she leaned forward and ended the interview. I'd like to go home. I'm not feeling well. When did you realize that, hey, they're looking at me? Until I sat in that room, uh, I, I guess I just, I didn't want to believe it. I didn't want to accept the fact that somebody would think I was capable of doing such an act. Two weeks later, Linda Dolop is handcuffed, put in the back of a squad car, and charged with attempted murder, elevated aggravated assault, and filing a false report. She would plead not guilty to all charges. So you did not try to kill your husband? Absolutely not. Never thought about it. No, never. No, absolutely not. This whole thing about the yoga and the peace and the tranquility, there are two Lindas. The guy is still not dead. Stephanie Anderson is the Cumberland County Maine District Attorney in charge of prosecuting the case against Linda Dola. There is this facade of Linda that is very, you know, naturopathic and meditative and, and all of that. But there's also the Linda on the inside that is very, very different. Do I think she's a murderer? I mean, generally? No, I don't think she's a murderer generally. I think she tried to kill her husband. After she was indicted, Linda Doloff, who still limps from the bullet in her hip, hired defense attorney Dan Lilly, a veteran of more than 50 homicide cases, who says she was offered a plea bargain. The prosecutor prior to the trial offered a three-year term in jail. She turned that down because she said she didn't commit the crime and she wanted a trial. It is a huge gamble. Now Linda could face up to a 30-year prison sentence if convicted. This was going to be a Super Bowl uh, from our point of view. I mean, uh, the best on both sides had gathered within this case to wrestle it out in that courtroom. All of Portland, Maine is watching. So she takes this baseball bat. She goes into Jeffrey Dallas' bedroom while he's defenseless and sound asleep, and she whacks him in the head with this baseball bat we don't know how many times. Stephanie Anderson is a tough, no-nonsense uh, prosecutor. Uh, if she has you in her sights, you know, she will march down the field and get the job done. But of course, I want to win. I want my client to be found not guilty. I think and then on the other side, you have Dan Lilly. I mean, he is the top defense attorney in this state. Well, let's look at evidence. It's a showdown, and both are on their game. And she starts banging on this guy, is their theory. He's six foot two. He weighs 220 pounds. She's 120 pounds, I believe, and it's five foot three or four. And she's going to take him off. Why bother with guns when you have such a wonderful weapon? This was Linda Dolliff. No intruder. She had the motive. She had the opportunity. Were you an angry, bitter woman over this settlement? Not at all. Linda paints a picture of a beautiful night. They had dinner. She made dinner. Mm -hmm. They had wine in the hot tub. Mm -hmm. And then they had sex. Mm -hmm. The 
bathroom was staged with, with, with two wine glasses uh, to make it look like maybe they did. So how, how do you get the jury to see that this innocent looking woman could do something so horrible? Through the evidence. When 2020 returns, the case against Linda Dola and the literal smoking gun. Stay with us. from Standish accused of trying to kill her husband. There were no eyewitnesses. The DA has forensic technicians still to testify. It is a trial with all the intrigue of a juicy crime novel. The husband, a baseball bat taken to his chiseled jaw as he slept. His alluring but soon to be divorced wife accused of beating him nearly to death. But for the prosecution, there's something missing. I think that juries would prefer to have an eyewitness or a videotape or something. Um, but a circumstantial case can be just as strong as a case with an eyewitness. Instead, the district attorney has a star witness who remembers nothing. No other eyewitnesses, no confession. And across at the defense table, a woman who frankly doesn't look like she could do it. People that are very attractive and intelligent and, you know, have a persona of being you know, a peace-loving person are capable of doing very, very heinous and serious crimes. And not tell a book was cover. So they went after her, first with the weapons, which police say scream inside job, not intruder. The gun's not foreign to the scene, the baseball bat's not foreign to the scene, and they're not weapons of opportunity. It wasn't by the bedside for protection. It wasn't by the bedside for protection. It was tucked away behind some machinery in his garage. And there were two other baseball bats that what I would consider in plain view and more easily accessible. And on that bat handle, important solid evidence difficult to explain away. There was some human blood stains on the grip area that came back as matching Linda Doloff. The bat was found on the floor at the foot of the bed near the blood. And she indicated that she went that around the, the end of the bed and she ran into or hit things on the floor. We believe that she hit the bat. This is the Ruger 22. Okay. Uh, and what about the other weapon, the gun used on Linda? This was found on the hallway, just at the staircase on the second floor landing. It was kept in Jeff Dolloff's dresser drawer. And this is the gun that Linda Dolloff received the gunshot wound from. Prosecutors told the jury Linda used it to shoot herself. This whole thing, from the state's perspective, is staged. The prosecution believes that Linda shot herself I'm, as part I'm of the cover-up. Glad you asked that. She shot on the right side and she's right-handed. So why is that difficult to do? First of all, if you're right-handed, normally I think you would shoot over here. Like District that. Attorney Anderson has an answer for that. She says Linda used a two-hand grip. I believe she used her dominant hand to steady the, the gun, and she used her left hand to pull the trigger. I mean, it doesn't make sense that you'd do this. You would, you would go across your body. We don't usually think of, the, of shooting ourselves in the gut. She didn't shoot herself in the gut. She shot herself in the love handle. She shot herself in the fleshy part of her body. She's a trained yoga instructor. She knows where the vital organs are. Did she injure her hip in that? Yes, she did, but it didn't go anywhere near vital organs. It didn't go near um, veins or arteries. It was a place where, you know, she was either very deliberate or very, very lucky. And what about taking a gun to yourself? That, I, <laughs> to me, that is the most ridiculous part of the story. I find it absurd. I don't ever see myself getting into a position where I could actually point a gun at myself and pull the trigger. No. With the forensics that are there, is it possible that you shot yourself, do you believe? There would be blood in the barrel. There would be, I think, something called tattooing around the wound. There would be um, the burn marks on my shirt. There is no evidence of 
any of those, and my DNA is not on the trigger, and I have no idea how I could shoot myself if I did not pull the trigger. Prosecutors knew this would be a major part of Linda Doloff's defense, so they sent the 22 caliber Ruger handgun and the shirt Linda was wearing that night to the Maine State Crime Lab for testing. Forensic firearms expert Kimberly Stevens. Look to see if there's gunpowder on the shirt. If the gunshot wound was self-inflicted, then we're looking at a shot that would need to be fairly close range because someone's arm is only so far. Stevens test fired the actual gun that shot the bullet into Linda's hip, and you can see the bright muzzle flash, which you would think would burn gunpowder into Linda's shirt if it was fired at close range. But surprisingly enough, Linda was right. The gunpowder the state expected to find was not there. I looked at it visually under the stereo microscope, and there was no powder residue on the shirt. And even though you get a muzzle flash, there was no singeing or burning of the material on that shirt. But the state, not happy with that result, was not ready to give up. Stephen says gunpowder can shake loose from clothing, so it doesn't always show up. So she performed a second test, this time looking not for powder, but for lead vapor. The lead vapor is very fine particle. It gets embedded in the weave, and it's not always easy to see. But a chemical spray will turn it purple and visible with the naked eye. And that's confirmation for lead. So prosecutors told the jury to ignore the gunpowder test. It isn't important anyway. And look at the lead vapors. They tell us the gun was fired at close range. It could have been one inch, two inch, three inches, anywhere along that. But it was no further than 18. The blood of Linda's DNA. Next, the prosecution went to work on trying to prove Linda had Jeff's blood on her shirt, tying her to the attack. But even though the bedroom where Jeff was attacked was coated from floor to ceiling, Linda didn't have much on her. She's got blood here on her left cuff, a little streak, and she's got spatter under her right armpit. So that is pretty damaging. I think it's consistent with a baseball stance and whacking somebody with it. But that, according to the prosecution's own blood spatter expert, Detective Scott Goslin, is flat out wrong. Is that accurate? I'm not sure that it's accurate to say that there was no other explanation for it. In fact, Detective Goslin's official report read to the jury said, no conclusion can be drawn from Linda Doloff's clothing. The expert said Jeff could have spit up blood on Linda while she was comforting him. But again, the prosecution would not give up and still told the jury that Jeff's blood could only have gotten on Linda one way. How could she get those stains but for the fact that she was whacking him with this baseball bat? There's no other explanation for that. When she says there is no other explanation, that's not true. Um... I guess I would have to look at the statement. I'll show it to you. Yep, yep. Right, I don't think that that would be accurate. And whatever happened to that flash that looked like a person to the first officer on the scene, Sergeant Jim Esterbrook? I can see one person in the window. I'm going to get some eyes on the house. Evidence, says Dan Lilly, of an intruder, a third person in the house. To me, it's the most important evidence in the case. It certainly is to the defense. He saw something that he believed to be a person. I mean, it's a total non-issue. We think it was a person, and that person was Linda. So how do you know it's not Linda that he sees? Linda's upstairs beating her husband with a bat. I mean, you can't have it both ways. Lily says it's impossible for an injured Linda to be downstairs in front of a window, then upstairs turning on lights with the dispatcher, and then back downstairs to open the door for police. Well, that's a lot of tra traveling for a person who's been shot in her bare feet. A case with no witnesses, little cut and dry physical evidence. Prosecutors are on the ropes, and Dan Lilly is going in for the kill. This is the guy. That trigger. Guess what? There's no DNA of Linda on that trigger. Can prosecutors save their case with a little help from the Bible and Linda's own private writings? You weren't in a desperate situation? I, I was not desperate. No, I was not desperate. Caught in the trap of her own making. All rise, please. The verdict in the jury's own words when we return.
a little wine, a soak in the tub, and yes, even a little sex before bed. A divorce so agreeable, anger so managed by the principles learned in her yoga. Linda Doloff says she harbored no hard feelings, that her husband was about to bring a new woman into his life to enjoy the house Linda and Jeff had built together. The prosecution has in fact said that you were concerned about your legacy, that you were concerned about being viewed as the divorced woman, the scorned woman. Were you angry and bitter about that? This whole scorn woman idea is absurd to me. Before I met Jeff, okay, I owned my own house, I owned my own business, I had a career, um, I had my own retirement account, um, I supported myself. And I can do that with or without a man. So you weren't desperate? I, I was not desperate. No, I was not desperate. Is that the real Linda? Perhaps the most damaging evidence police found in their year-long investigation is on her computer, her personal writings titled the Corinthians document, after the letter the Apostle Paul wrote to his congregation about unconditional love. Linda's version is a series of journal entries which reveal a different and, yes, very desperate woman about to be abandoned. I'm so, so scared. I have nothing. One of the things that will be most difficult is to have someone else enjoying the fruits of our labor. She's having some serious issues with not, not only another woman coming into her home and taking her place, but the uncertainty of her future. I cannot eat, I cannot sleep, I cannot breathe. I'm in a place where I cannot sustain myself. I'm not Linda. If she wasn't going to have her life, um, it was going to be a very different life for her. The Corinthians document had a great impact on me. In the jury box, Linda's private writings took on the weight of her own voice. She never took the witness stand, but the words on her computer may have explained the motive Linda denied having. She sounded very confused and frustrated and left out, pushed away. As the jury debated, the attorneys waited, the prosecutor in her courthouse office. You wonder what's going on, you wonder what they're thinking, you wonder if you, you know, if your summation should have been a little bit different. And defense attorney Dan Lilly at a corner bar and grill. When I get the message the jury has a verdict, the stu my stomach goes up into my throat. I, I'm ambivalent. I, I see no way in one, on one hand that they could uh, convict. And then if I think about it, I think on the other hand, there may be uh, many ways that they could convict. Um, I understand we have a verdict. Are we ready to bring the jury back? We are. Right. 2020 spoke to five of the 12 jurors after the trial. They brought us inside the jury box and behind closed doors during deliberations, talking about their doubts that Linda did it. About the shadow in the window, and I just kept thinking back, what if someone was in the house? What if there's someone else was there? They did not do a sweep of the entire house when they first arrived. They went straight up to his bedroom and did not check for someone who may have been running from the house. And they told us about the evidence that hit home. If it turns dark purple, it'll tell me it's... They believe the state's like ballistics reaction. expert. Confirmation for lead. She was no farther than 18 inches away when she was shot. And they did not believe Linda's story. To be 18 inches away from somebody holding a gun out at you, there's no way that you couldn't see somebody. If you know that she's coming, why not just use the bat on her as she comes around the corner? The jurors did say they sympathized with Linda's situation, about to be forced out of her home. I really wanted her to be innocent. I truly did. And back behind closed doors, the first two votes were split. The initial vote, I think, was seven guilty and five not guilty. All of them women voting not guilty. I thought to myself, there's just no way this petite little woman. But as time went on and we heard more and more about what she was capable of doing, you know, helping build the home and lifting these heavy things and very flexible and anger does a lot to people. In the end, though, the jurors say they watched Linda Doloff in court. She never changed expressions. She was stone cold. And determined she didn't love Jeff like she claimed. Her blank expression as he took the stand betraying her true feelings, they thought. It would be hard for me to keep tears back when I saw him walk into the room and have to repeat questions and 
that he can't remember things. And I mean, that would just touch me very deeply. As And with that, say the jurors, the debate ended. A unanimous vote and then total silence. Waiting for the verdict. I, I wasn't really that frightened because the evidence certainly had cleared me and I counted on the jury. Um, I was certainly still frightened. As to the charge of attempted murder, did you find the defendant, Lyndon Dollar, guilty or not guilty? Guilty. As to the charge of elevated, aggravated assault, did you find the defendant, Lyndon Dollar, guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Um, and when the verdict was read, I, I felt like I couldn't even accept it. Numb is the best thing that I, I can say. The realization of the verdict came when they put me in my cell and I heard the slam of that metal door. And then the grief and the despair and anguish of what really happened sunk in. Linda Doloff says she is most disappointed about the way she thinks the jury reached its verdict, judging her demeanor in court. And she claims ignoring the physical evidence that proved she did not shoot herself or beat her husband. I've lost my husband, my home, my family, friends, my way of life, my financial security, my pets, my dignity, my privacy, and now my freedom. So unless you're sitting where I am, judging me is not right and it's unjust. Today, Jeff Dolloff has returned to the land where he grew up alone, without Linda, and carrying with him the belief that the verdict, while correct, is painful for both. A terrible sadness, and it's not for me. There's parts of me that's never gonna be the same. No question about that. She has given up everything. If I'd have thought she was remorseful, if I'd thought she just made a terrible mistake, if she'd have apologized, I'd have tried to help her huge. I did not try to kill my husband. An apology Jeff Dolliff is unlikely to hear anytime soon from a woman who turned down the opportunity for a short stay in jail before trial. There's no way I'm going to admit to doing something I did not do. Absolutely not. I have nothing to be sorry for. So an apology is not in order? Not for the crime itself. I am deeply sorry that he is hurt. I am terribly sorry that he'll never be the same. I'll never be the same. And he did not deserve this, and neither do I. We both lost. Linda Dolliff was later sentenced to 16 years in prison. As of 2012, she is appealing her conviction. Jeff remains in the house he and Linda built. He continues to suffer the physical effects of the attack, but he says he's happy to be alive. I'm John Quinones. Please join us next time for another edition of 2020 on ID.